Hello, good afternoon. Today our guest is Dr. Felipe Valencia, and we're going to be talking about the Jesuit order and its role in transmitting human capital. Who are the Jesuits? Uh, the Jesuits are one denomination of uh, Catholics. Um, others include uh, Franciscans, uh, Dominicans. Uh, there were an order that was founded, uh, I guess, for us a long time ago in the 1500s, uh, but for Catholic standards, a fairly new Catholic order, if you compare it to the Franciscans and the Dominicans that were founded uh, in even earlier times. Why did they go to Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So this is part of the European colonization, in this case of the Americas or Latin America, uh, through the Spanish and the Portuguese Empire. In this case, they were sent uh, by the royal crowns uh, to quote unquote help colonize uh, some of these lands. Uh, so sometimes they would just go to the big capitals. And in particular, in I guess what brings us here today, uh, they were also sent to some pretty remote locations back then, but even nowadays, uh, to establish Catholic missions. Uh, in this case, uh, they go to uh, what nowadays is mostly Paraguay, so the southern part of Paraguay, the northern part of Argentina, uh, and the, the southern area of Brazil, Rio Grande do Sul, uh, to found uh, these, uh, in this case, uh, Guarani Jesuit missions. And the Guaranis are the indigenous people that live there. Well, Felipe, I really appreciate this article because I'm interested in the relationship between religion and human capital. Recently, I published a piece for the Mises Institute, and I do believe that your article was cited. So back to these cr 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 Christian missionaries. In 1850, some, sometime around then, the, the, the Society of Jesus founded a school in J Jamaica, St. George's College. And it is still prestigious to, today, but earlier, like in the 1950s and before, it was really prestigious. Many of his students studied it at Ivy League universities. Yeah, that, that's exactly uh, the case. I mean, I'm, I'm Colombian myself, uh, and there is this uh, conception that uh, at least amongst the Catholic orders, as you probably know, Colombia is an overwhelmingly Catholic uh, country, as many countries in Latin America. Those also things are changing with, with uh, Protestantism and, and stuff. Um, still to today, some of the most famous universities uh, are uh, uh, administered by the Jesuits. And even worldwide, if you think about uh, places like the US, uh, clearly Georgetown to today is a very famous uh, Jesuit university. So what I wanted to do in my paper is kind of like to explore that relationship a bit deeper, as you're mentioning the case in the Caribbean, there are obviously like important missions that were set up. How can we trace that even further back in time? And in this case, that's these Jesuit missions established in the Guarani lands that started in 1609, so quite early, early on. And, and let me speak some more about the school, St. George's College. So, Felipe, in the, in the 1950s, the 60s, and before, seriously, when you, check, when you check the records, this school sent many students to Ivy League universities. Many of and the, 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 the students studied finance, medicine, law. It, it's a brilliant institution. Today, it's still prominent, but other schools have continued to build on their academic program, so it doesn't appear to be as pro prominent as it was back then. But in Jamaica, they made a serious impact. I, I totally buy that story, and I think that that was one of the, of the experiences presenting this paper, is that people would come to me and say, look, in my country, there's something similar. Um, so I, I completely buy that, uh, that argument. Um, I think what I was trying to do from a more economic standpoint is what to look at what we call the externalities of religion. Uh, so yes, there are these missions, uh, but imagine like the, these missionaries are teaching you skills, uh, are teaching you basic arithmetic, uh, maybe there's going to be an impact of those uh, quote unquote human capital investments, in this case through education. 
And there's another beautiful paper. I don't know if you had a uh, professor Leonard Wachenkon from Princeton in, in the show, uh, but he has a great paper for Benin uh, in Africa. And he says, look, in, in the country of Benin, actually, there was a very similar mechanism. There are these early uh, missionaries that go there. Uh, and to today, as you were saying, these are prestigious institutions. These are people that are sending uh, their graduates to top universities, as you mentioned, Ivy Leagues and, and top schools in the UK as well. Uh, so, there, so that's exactly what I was trying to explore in this paper. Like, how can we look at that uh, very, very early on during the Spanish colonization of the Americas? And back in the 50s, St. George's College was not only sending students to Ivy League schools, but some of these students were scoring really high grades to get into these schools. Like their scores were, could be compared with the best students in the world. Sometimes they were the best students. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised. I mean, first of all, because like Jamaica has a, has a great record of, of having top students, especially in, in the US. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised, like I'm impressed, but I'm not surprised. And second, there's also recent research in, in my paper, I focus mostly on literacy, like are you able to read and write? Uh, but there is recent uh, research uh, by Eric Aznar in, in Spain, uh, where he finds that there's also numeracy. So it's not only are you able to read and write, but also also like arithmetic numeracy skills were higher in these missions historically. So what you're saying for the 20th century Jamaica is exactly what we're finding for colonial times, uh, in this case in, in Paraguay. And where did they settle in the country? Did they settle in urban areas, rural areas, rich areas? What that's were these a, that, settlements like? Yeah, that, 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 that's, that, that's a very important question. So the Jesuits actually followed a two-pronged strategy. So the, they did go to the big capitals of the empire, what today is Bogota, Lima, Buenos Aires, Quito, uh, but they also went to fairly remote areas. So, and, and those were the ones that I was very interested in because of course there's many things happening in Buenos Aires, in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, just anecdotally, Sao Paulo, the one of the biggest city in South America, it was originally a Jesuit mission. But then you don't know if it's oh, is the impact of the Jesuits or is it just because Sao Paulo has everything, you know? And, but then in this case, they went to fairly remote areas, uh, essentially what nowadays are, are remote uh, forests. So even nowadays, it's a bit hard to get to these areas uh, in rural Paraguay. I mean, also in the surrounding areas, uh, rural Argentina and rural Brazil. Uh, this would be the southern state of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil, and then the northern states of Argentina, Misiones and Corrientes, and the southern states of Paraguay, again, uh, Misiones, which is missions in Spanish, uh, and Itaipua. So it would be, in this case, a, a rural setting, mostly in Paraguay. And the human capital is important. On this show, I've often noted that human capital is different from education. So education is getting the degree, human capital is starting a business or creating a useful patent. Based on what you have been saying in your article, the Jesuits invested in human capital. They taught people how to apply their skills. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, it's, it's obviously it's a big, big topic in economics. Uh, human capital, I mean, one of the main determinants of growth in the, especially in the long term, uh, people like Andre Schleifer uh, have uh, written at Harvard University, have written extensively about the importance of human capital for growth. Uh, and yes, I mean, broadly understood is investments in human beings. Uh, it could be understood more from the health aspect and some people do that. I do a little bit of that in the paper, but mostly uh, it's gonna be education. So skills, how to read and write, basic arithmetic. And in the case of these uh, missions, also they were taught interesting skills. So uh, wood carving, embroidery, masonry, things that for, for us today maybe are not that important, but back then they were essential for the survival of these missions. And um, so that's, 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 that's exactly right, human capital is, perhaps the key uh, word in the whole article. And then I also like this snippet on page two, and you write, 
I find that people closer to missionary districts have moved out of agriculture and into manufacturing and services, specializing in more skilled labor. They have also been able to adopt newly available agricultural technologies faster. Yes, yeah, so, so that's getting more into the mechanisms because you can say, or what I do in this piece is to link historical missions to modern uh, these areas are a bit why like like what are the specific mechanisms of transmission and the the what i find in this paper is that perhaps the main one is what we call structural transformation in economics which is nothing more than the usual uh, growth and development process which is going from agriculture into manufacturing and services so that's what you're uh, reading there and that's exactly what I find here. So these areas, as I uh, mentioned before, are mostly rural, but even though the rural areas, they're already moving out uh, from agriculture into manufacturing and services. The last thing about technologies, this is kind of a, a very neat and interesting experiment, mostly going on in Brazil, is the introduction of soy seeds. So there's this new genetically engineered soy variety that it's introduced to Brazil, and this is a classic in the development literature, if you think papers like Foster's and Rosenzweig's a paper in 1995 about human capital and technology adoption, I find exactly the same thing that they found in India uh, when these uh, new uh, seeds were introduced. People that have human capital, and back to your previous question, uh, are not only doing better or richer, but they're also adopting new technologies. So I think that this is at the core of this idea about is history persistence or change? Yes, there's a lot of persistence. There's a lot of economic persistence and human capital persistence in this paper. But there is also this idea that you're able to embrace choice in a better way if you have higher human capital. And again, that's a, a, a that has a long tradition in, in, in economic development. And the incomes, are incomes also higher today for the former pl for places that were once associated with the Jesuit missions? Yes. So I think that that's, I mean, that's kind of like the bottom line, right? In economics, we only care about income and are these places richer or poorer? And that's going to like, uh, kind of like determine what happens. And the answer is yes. So I do track this uh, human capital shock. I mean, I find that these people indeed have higher education uh, even today, uh, but that's also true for income. So these places in the middle of rural Paraguay mostly, but also in Argentina and Brazil, uh, are slightly richer today. So the answer is yes. A more contemporary example. So Jamaica's leading high school today was actually started by the Society of Jesus in 1960. And the, it, 1960 is fairly recent. Most of our prominent high schools in Jamaica are well over 90. So that school was once seen as an institution that people would attend if they did not go to St. George's College, but today it has surpassed St. George's College in contemporary intellectual excellence, Campion College. Many of our students today also study at elite Ivy League schools. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that 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 I mean, maybe some of your of your audience would be asking, like, oh, why why do we care about Paraguay or Paraguay in the 1600s, but I think that that and it's a valid question. And I think that the main lesson is it's because of the importance of human capital investments. Uh, I mean, yes, maybe we didn't or I didn't need to do all this like trouble of like getting to the archives and all that stuff. But I think that what what really is important for today is these lessons from the past in this case indicate the importance of human capital investments. And that, I think, is what you actually get from this article. Uh, I have other work, for instance, with my, with my co-author, uh, William Maloney at the World Bank. Uh, we look at the importance of human capital investments in the United States, uh, looking at a different kind of like part of the distribution, uh, more towards engineers uh, historically. But it's, it's the exact same lesson. It's just the importance of human capital investments, of educational investments in historical times, in modern times, at different levels of the uh, distribution of skills. Felipe, the Gurani people, how did the Society of Jesus change that group? 
majorly. And I think that that's what's interesting about this study. Uh, it's not about the Jesuit missions, it's about the Guarani Jesuit mission. So this is the indigenous tribe that uh, was already living there in the area. Uh, it's Tupi in Portuguese, Guarani is the, is the Spanish name. So this is a two-way process because I think that many times we think about colonization and, and there's a lot of books as if it's falling from the sky, but there's the locals. I mean, and obviously this is a two-way process, a very uh, contentious, interesting, uh, in terms of history, fascinating process in, in my view. Uh, so they were changed. I mean, I think that, and, and this is also what the literature is studying more and more, which is, okay, fine, like maybe there are some of these outcomes and they're doing better there, but what about their communities? Are they still tight knit or not? So there is a lot of that. I mean, I also have other work looking at Paraguay and the Guarani, uh, more in the context of the Triple Alliance War. And um, I would say that they would change forever, uh, for better, or for worse. Like, I mean, I'm not a, a moral philosopher to, to say anything like that, uh, but clearly forever. I mean, let me just, just say one, uh, I think, important thing, which is to today in Paraguay, there are two official languages. The first one is obviously Spanish, as you probably guessed or, or know, uh, but the second one is Guarani. And I actually think uh, to the credit of both the Jesuit and the Franciscan missionaries uh, that they spend the time to learn these languages, uh, to write the grammar of these languages. And there are many linguists that say it's because of that that you find this type of, of persistence in the language. So they were changed forever, um, but they also change Jesuits and they also change Paraguay forever. Uh, so I think that this is kind of like a broader question about what we call religious syncretism in Latin America, which is, is not only like Europeans coming, uh, is what about the locals that were there? And then there's this interesting dialogue, in some cases confrontation, in some cases very violent, if you think about North America, but in others, I think fascinating and actually a two-way process that enriched uh, both parties. Uh, but it's, I mean, it's obviously like, a, I mean, there, there are many historians uh, writing books and books about it. So this is just a short summary of this fascinating history. I like your study because Roman Catholics are painted in a positive light. So there's a line of literature arguing that the Roman Catholic Church had a negative effect on development. But your study is one of many newer studies that, that that, that's, that, that seeks to refute this view. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, again, the, it, it, the basics are an economic, uh, uh, essentially, argument, which is, what were these religious organizations doing? In the case of the Jesuits, they were also providing skills, so it's not a surprise that it has a positive impact. And the way that I see it in the broader literature and kind of like expanding from Catholicism to other uh, uh, religions, uh, Sasha Becker and Ludger Vesman in a, in a classic study in the Quarterly Journal of Economics as well, uh, find something very similar for Protestants in Prussia. Uh, so Protestants are a little bit uh, more, have, have more income, are richer historically than, than Catholics, but it's through this human capital a channel. So they're essentially encouraged or even forced uh, to read the Bible. Uh, but then once you read a Bible, this is a non-excludable technology, so you just know how to read. Um, uh, there's a, a famous set of studies uh, by Zvi uh, Eckstein and Maristella Botticini, uh, in culminating in a, the book called The Chosen Few, uh, where they find exactly the same for the Jewish population. So you encourage reading the Torah, even when you're a kid, five years old, and then eventually this stays with you for life. So I don't think that it's surprising. And obviously, like a more historical rather than economic response, we need to understand this in the broader process and context of colonization in the Americas. This is a broad spectrum, like there's all the way, I, would, I guess we can think about uh, slavery on the, on, the, on the war side of things. Uh, through different colonial institutions, uh, the Hacienda, the Mita, that has been also studied in economics by Melissa Dell, uh, also at Harvard, um, to, in this case, these missions, 
uh, which if you compare them to slavery, uh, it's not surprising that they that they were uh, much quote unquote better. Uh, but I think that the core argument is one about the economic externalities of religion, and that's exactly what I do in my paper. So your paper has an emphasis as an emphasis on human capital. But what about other social variables like civic capital or health? Did you see anything relating to these variables? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I mean, I saw a little bit of health as well. So I, in my paper, I tried to compare two uh, very specific orders, the Franciscans and the Jesuits. Uh, maybe I won't get too much in the details unless you want me to. Uh, but I also, and, and kind of in that comparison, I also wanted to, to look at health outcomes. And I also found uh, more positive health outcomes uh, in the Jesuit missions, which was a bit surprising and interesting. I guess they're richer. So these broader human capital uh, investments also translate into health. Uh, I didn't find uh, a lot of other uh, more institutional mechanisms. I guess those are more working more at the national level. So it's not like these places are voting differently or have different uh, village councils, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it was mostly human capital broadly understood, including health. Yeah. And did these missions have a bigger effect in Paraguay? I found not really. I mean, I, I thought that that's what I was going to find, but the, the impacts extend also to Brazil and to Argentina. So, um, and, I, and I think that that was surprising. And again, it speaks to this uh, idea about what's the importance of national institutions versus human capital. Uh, I found it for all of them. So maybe there could be clear and important institutional differences that make Argentina a bit richer uh, than than Paraguay or Brazil a bit richer than Paraguay, but these effects uh, maybe at the more micro level at the more from the from the from the bottoms up rather than the top down is something that I found for the three countries, which is surprising. I mean, it just tells you like it doesn't matter in which institutional regime you are, and the, this impact of human capital at least at a more localized level uh, is present there. In Paraguay. Did they settle in richer places? I we commented briefly on this before, but we didn't really get into the question. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, that's that that's what all that all that we do in economics, or most that we do in economics, which is okay. Is this just by coincidence, or is this really what we call a causal effect? So is this just because they happen to settle in good places? And those places are going to be rich anyways because they're good places because I don't know the geography or weather characteristics. Uh, I find this not to be the case. Uh, so actually, and this goes back to maybe the first question that you asked me. Uh, the Jesuits are a new order, so the other orders, especially the Franciscans, were taking the better places. So the places that are closest to Asuncion, which is the capital of Paraguay. So if anything, they 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 get second pick. So they're 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 just picking like the 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 backwaters of the of the empire in this case within Paraguay, uh, and they settle there. And I actually have some comparisons in the text where I show the historical population. So historically, the Franciscans are doing a bit better, or they start at the same level, and then there is this interesting divergence. So even though they potentially pick the worst places, meaning the Jesuits picking the worst places relative to the Franciscans. Uh, they actually do better in the long term. So it's interesting that even if they picked the quote unquote worst places farther away from the capital, worse geographic and weather characteristics, they ended up doing better in the long term. And my argument is, a, 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 again, a human capital uh, argument. And why did the Jesuits do, why did they, did, why were the Jesuits more effective than the Franciscans? I think that is because of the type of investments that they did. So like we're kind of circling back to this uh, question that you asked me before, which is what are they actually doing? And the, and the Jesuits are focusing on human capital, educating the kids, uh, not only the boys, but also the girls, which I think is very interesting and re revolutionary, especially back then. In basic uh, arithmetic literacy, uh, they're teaching the, the, the younger uh, adults also uh, in, in these more artisanal workshops. 
Uh, whereas the, the the Franciscans, I think it's it's a bit of a of more like tending for the poor and the sick, kind of a more short term approach, maybe reducing inequality. And this goes just like all the way back to to the actual founders of these orders, uh, San Ignatius of Loyola, who's actually founding the the Jesuit or the Society of Jesus Order out of uh, University of of Paris. He was a Basque knight uh, from day one, uh, emphasizing human capital uh, versus uh, San Francisco Assis, uh, Assisi in, in northern Italy, uh, emphasizing more tending for the poor and the sick. So I think that in the whole ethos of these uh, Catholic orders, you see this DNA of uh, maybe investing more in schools. And you've told me a lot about uh, the case of Jamaica, which is very similar to the case in, in Colombia and other places in Latin America and even the US. Um, whereas for the Franciscans is more, I would say, kind of a little bit more short term, like help the poor and the sick. I mean, it's not like they don't have schools nowadays, but in relative terms, I think that the the Jesuits are more human capital oriented than the Franciscans. So I did not attend a Roman Catholic high school. My high school was formed by Protestants. The missionaries were affiliated with an evangelical church in the States. They went to Jamaica in 1907, started a Bible college around 1926. Mm -hmm. And the, the high school was officially formed in 1927. And in, if you live in urban Jamaica, my school, I went to Arden. So Arden and Campion are the prominent schools in urban Jamaica. So when I was doing GSAT, no, we call it PEP, but GSAT was the entrance exam at the time. Interestingly, Jamaica is still colonial in the sense that historically schools were created for the elite. So in England, a public school is a school that's sponsored by smart children who are also rich. So in Jamaica, based on how the education system is structured, you're still doing an entrance exam. So it's still very European. Mm -hmm. So when I when I visit America, people study at schools near to where they live. J Jamaica still has the traditional path to education where you do a rigorous exam as a as a twelve year old and you get into a quality school. So one year, my school I wasn't a student then, but two students were honored by an, a Jamaican institution that's responsible for getting students into prominent high schools, sorry, prominent Ivy League universities. So my former, my high school got the top boy and the top girl. And I'm just seeing this because I'm always impressed by the quality of work that has been done by Christian missionaries, not just for my high schools, but other distinguished schools in Jamaica, especially the Methodists and the Anglicans. Yeah, I mean, what, what you say resonates a lot. Um, uh, for instance, the again, let me just mention the, the work of Leonard Washington. But the stories that you're telling me are exactly the type of stories that he tells for Benin. Uh, and I, I don't think that it's about being Catholic or being Jesuit in particular. Again, it's about the investments in human capital that you do. Uh, and what you're saying is very, very consistent with the literature especially for Africa. So, I mean, my paper is Catholic missions quite early on, starting in 1609, but there's a, an even bigger literature, I would say, uh, looking at Protestant Christian missions in Africa. Uh, so what you're saying about Jamaica is very, very similar to some famous papers in the literature, uh, thinking about the work of people like uh, Julia Cage and Valeria Rueda in the AJ Applied, uh, where they find exactly what you're saying. Uh, it's more about Christian, meaning Christian but Protestant missions, uh, having a bigger impact, not in the 1600s, but in the 1900s, and not in Latin America, but in Africa. But, uh, but the message is exactly the same. It resonates and echoes the same way, which is historical investments from religious orders, religious institutions in human capital. And uh, those, as you've tell, you're telling your, your personal story, um, seem to have an impact even today. And uh, so what I did is just one more example of, of something that I guess many people already knew. 
and but 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 just kind of like going back in history and looking whether that was also the case for the jesuit catholic order in south america and what's so fascinating is that these schools in jamaica could be performing at a higher level than foreign institutions in the u.s if we decide to compare them using PISA, because in Jamaica, education at the secondary level is quite rigorous. It's either you're going to pass or fail. You're not going to get free books and free assistance. So it's it's really designed for people who are already smart. It's serious business. Yeah, I mean, of course. So now, now we need to be a bit careful because, okay, fine. Like these Jesuits in the 1600s, uh, what does it really mean to to talk about education and human capital today? Uh, I mean, this is not only a literature. Like there's a whole field in economics, uh, in educational economics in particular, uh, looking at these at these topics. Uh, where yes, I mean, as you're saying, I mean, okay, how are how are countries doing in the international PISA tests? I mean, I'm Colombian and we do uh, exceptionally bad in those tests. Uh, how can we improve performance? How can we uh, get more kids into school? But once we do that, because coverage is actually good in many Latin American countries, uh, but quality is not. So how can we improve quality and how can we move from primary to secondary school? How can we start thinking about tertiary school? Once we do that, which careers, which majors, and that kind of like takes us back to, to this other work that I was mentioning on engineers in the US. Uh, what's the importance of picking STEM professions? Uh, what about gender? I mean, there's so many topics. That's why I guess it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a field of its own in economics and is the fascinating field of, of education economics. I mean, I saw that you have had many prominent um, economists in your podcast, which, which I admire. Uh, for instance, Professor Hanushek at, at Stanford, which is obviously uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, names in the education economics uh, camp. So, so that's a whole fascinating field. Uh, I'm just contributing humbly from the economic history side. But Philippi, I, we're, we're both living in developing countries, and this is a big sticking point for people like us in the developing world. How do we create a superior average? So the best schools in developing countries could be excellent, but the average is mediocre. How do we create a better average? This is a huge debate in education. Um, I will just compare two models. I used to be in Germany before. I think the German model is a lot about what you're saying. Like, let's let's the mean be very good. I mean, they're moving more and more towards clusters of excellence, but it's still about the mean needs to be very good. If you go to the US, uh, it's more the excellence model. Like you have polls of amazing development, like uh, Ivy League universities, uh, but then you have some other institutions uh, that are not that great. If you think about some community colleges uh, and, or, or some neighborhoods that just really don't have great schools, unfortunately. Uh, I think this is a policy question. First, I guess the policymaker needs to decide whether they want to prioritize the average or whether they want to have clusters of excellence. Uh, and then you, you, I mean, depending on what you decide, then you work accordingly. I mean, clusters of excellence, obviously you're over investing in some schools and not others. Uh, in the case of Latin America, historically, it's been more, more toward tertiary education than primary and secondary. And you can think about whether that is regressive or not. Uh, but then you might also think, okay, we just want the whole country to do better. And that requires a massive investment. I mean, clearly uh, to have better students, you also need better teachers, you need better infrastructure uh, and there are massive school building campaigns. I mean, if you think about in history, countries like Indonesia, which has been very well studied, uh, did exactly that. And uh, obviously it takes a massive investment, but I think more than the massive investment, like in many cases, what you need is just the political will. Uh, some politicians or leaders, uh, saying, look, we want to we wanna invest in education and then, okay, what's your strategy and are you uh, thinking about excellence or are you thinking about uh, just leaving no child behind uh, in, the, in, the, in the Bush words uh, and then you, you act accordingly. I'm going to give you my solution for Jamaica. Spatial skills predict innovation and economic growth. J Jamaicans have strong spatial skills. So students need to attend technical schools and technical schools should be aligned to the private sector. Many students could 
simply be unsuited for a classical education. So if the private sector and the government were creating apprenticeship programs, then we'd be able to accelerate the human capital revolution. It doesn't make sense to Im impose the standards of a philosopher or an engineer on somebody who can make out of money as a plumber. No, I totally agree with that. And I think that there's a bit of this bias of like, oh, then everyone needs to go to college. I mean, I'm a university professor and I don't think so. I think that, I mean, if you look at the German model, for instance, which is highly successful, as you're very well saying, the, these apprenticeships are extremely important. And then in many cases, like these practical applied skills, yes, for a big chunk of the population, are going to give them even better uh, skills fitted to whatever is it that they want to do. So you can be an amazing plumber, you can be an amazing carpenter. And yes, I mean, I, when I talk about human capital, it's not everyone getting a PhD in classical philosophy. Uh, I also think that these practical skills are incredibly valuable, kind of aligning the educational sector with the private sector and providing these necessary skills, especially in a more interconnected, technologically, technologically developed world, uh, things like computer science skills, programming skills, uh, et cetera, et cetera, I mean, are fundamental. So I, I totally agree with you. So we have been speaking for nearly 40 minutes and then fortnightly after wrap up, but speaking to, to you has been a pleasure and we should continue the conversation some more. But for before sure, you go, I mean, I, are you going to do some research on Jamaica? Um, I'm always open to, I mean, Jamaica has an amazingly interesting history, which I know a little bit less of, um, but I, I'm open to, I mean, they say that time flies when you're having fun. And I mean, I, I, this, this, this really uh, seemed like two minutes, but I guess it's already been like 30, 40 minutes uh, as uh, almost. So look, I just wanted to thank you. Of course, I'm happy to continue the, the conversation. Uh, I'm working on other topics, which potentially could be in, of interest uh, to, to you and to your audience. Uh, things like historical conflict, uh, topics like uh, slavery and inequality in the context of Brazil. Uh, so I think that, yeah, I just take this as the, as the beginning of a hopefully fruitful conversation with you, but also to your audience. Uh, and yes, it's been a pleasure and an honor. And uh, just thank you very much and happy to learn more about Jamaica and, and maybe do more research in the Caribbean, which, which I think it's, it's profoundly needed. Uh, we yes. need to, to know more about the Caribbean. Uh, and I think the best minds need to think about this as well. All right. Bye, Felipe. Okay. Bye, Lipton. Very nice to meet you.